Hello and welcome to Tim Connolly Drums. Well, today I have a very special story to tell you that happened to me around 2008 or so, I would say, around 2008. And um, it, it was a very strange encounter because it was um, off the cuff meeting Neil Peart. And the, the meeting of Neil Peart was completely unplanned. I had no idea that I was going to be meeting Neil. So let me tell you how this happened. What I was playing in 2008, I was playing in a Beatles tribute band and we were a very successful Beatles tribute band. We were doing really well. We didn't dress up in the costumes of the Beatles, you know, with the wigs and the 1964 Ed Sullivan suits and all that. We didn't do any costumes. We were an audio tribute only. And um, I can remember the guy that played Paul, his name was Bob in the band. He had a connection with Terry Brown, who was Rush's producer, I think on 12 of their albums. He also produced The Who. He produced uh, Cutting Crew. If you know that song, I Just Died in Your Arms Tonight. So. Terry had a very, very substantial production background. He was an amazing producer, world famous. Anyways, Bob had this connection. So Bob asked Terry if he would produce our recordings that we wanted to do for promo of Beatles songs. Now, I'll post a few of those songs up so you can hear what uh, the recording sounded like. Terry ended up not only producing, but I think he mixed them and somebody else mastered them. Can't remember exactly who mastered them. It'll come to me. <laughs> it might have been Steve Negus from Saga, from the band Saga. I think he might have mastered them. Uh, probably because I know Steve does a lot of mastering. So it probably was Steve Negus from Saga. Anyways, getting to the story. So Bob gets hired. And we, or sorry, I mean, uh, Terry gets hired and we go to 16 River Studio or River 16 Studio in Oakville to do the recordings. And lo and behold, you know, I get to meet Terry and um, the recordings were to take place over a three day period. So, of course, you know, I had to get the right beetle drum sounds as close as we could, which was difficult to do. I did have a replica beetle drum kit at the time. But it was uh, it was difficult getting the correct sounds. So we just did it as close to what we thought the sounds were. And with the engineer and Terry and all of us working together to try and get the right drum sounds. Uh, I don't think they were exactly Ringo's sounds, especially that Ringo snare, man. I always loved the sound of Ringo's snare in the song Help. I always thought that was one of the best sounding snares ever recorded, to be totally honest. But... One thing about Beatles songs is the drums are often a little bit low in the mix. And sometimes you can't even hear in some case what Ringo is doing. So, um, you know, it's just the way the drums were recorded back in those days. You know, they were low in the mix and it wasn't just Beatles songs. The drums were very often not really featured. It's more about vocals. And, and I, I totally get it. I understand. Anyways, 
we get the sounds, we start doing the recording. The recording actually went really, really well. We recorded these songs live off the floor with a click. So we did do it with a metronome, but it was all live off the floor. We did not do the traditional drums, then the bass, then the rhythm guitar, then the guitar, the keyboard, the vocals, et cetera, et cetera. We did not do the traditional building up of the songs. We did it live off the floor, all of us on in the studio together, but we did it with a click. So it turned out to be quite successful because that's how the Beatles did it. So we tried to imitate them as closely as we could in terms of the way that they recorded the songs and the way that we were attempting to duplicate what they did. Anyways, we get all the songs done, but there was some overdubs that needed to be done. And Terry had said that he couldn't make it back to that studio because he had other things going on. And he asked me if I could come to his house in Toronto where he has a studio to do some of the drum overdubs. And I said, sure, no problem. So on the song Lady Madonna, there's a brush part which the Beatles overdubbed. So I went to um, Terry's house in Toronto. I can't remember exactly where it was in Toronto, but it was somewhere in Toronto. And I did these overdubs. So we're working on that overdub. Plus we did some tambourine, some clapping. There was a bunch of things that we had to do for these songs and overdubs. So I was there for probably six, seven, maybe eight hours. I, it was a pretty long uh, recording session there to get all these overdubs done. Anyways, I had just finished doing the brush overdub for Lady Madonna and I got the okay from Terry. He gave me the, the two thumbs up, you know, everything's good in the overdub and we were taking a break and the phone rings. Terry picks up the phone. I'm not paying attention. I'm just sitting there relaxing, you know, in between takes and he's talking he hangs the phone up. He talks for about 10 minutes. He hangs the phone up and he says, oh, uh, uh, let's uh, finish up what we're doing right now. And then we're going to take a little break because Neil's on his way over. And I was clueless. I was like, Neil, Neil who? You know, <laughs> didn't even dawn on me at all. Neil who? He says, Neil Peart. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'll never forget that moment. What do you mean Neil Peart is on his way over? And then he realizes, oh, shit. <laughs> he, you know, I'm a huge fan. Neil's my god. Neil's my number one. This The only one I think that would excite me more than Neil is Ringo. Because I was a, Ringo was the reason I started playing drums like millions of other drummers. It was Ringo's that started it. But Neil fueled it intensely. Anyways, he looks at me and he says, Neil Peart's on his way over. He has to pick something up. He has to sign something, um, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then he says to me, don't be a fan. When Neil gets here, you guys are peers. You're here working. Neil's going to come by. Neil's going to want to talk to you. He's going to ask you some questions. Do not be a fanboy. Don't melt down. Be calm. Be drumming peers. And I said, okay. <laughs> now, inside, I my nerves go through the roof because I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to see Neil. But not in a... I'd met Neil once before. I met Neil at a drum clinic. Now, Neil never did drum clinics. But in 1991 or 92, I got a call to go and... Uh, see Neil at a drum clinic. Somebody called me up and said, hey, I got tickets to uh, a Neil Peart drum clinic at Ontario Place. And this clinic is uh, on YouTube. There's a video of this clinic on YouTube that I went to. So I go to the clinic. At the end of the clinic, um, I remember Neil actually signed something for me, a poster, which I still have. And I got a chance to talk to him for five minutes or, or, or around there, around five minutes or whatever. But I was fanboy at that time. This time was completely different. I'd been read the riot act, no fanboy, just be normal. <laughs> so
So just imagine, put yourself in my situation, your hero, your favorite drummer in the world or your favorite hockey player. It's like, this is like Wayne Gretzky showing up unannounced. And oh my God, there he is. You know, it's just the shock. Anyways, so uh, we go and we do something else. I can't remember what we did. We did a tambourine part or something. And then uh, we finish, we do a, a number of takes and then we finish and Terry says, okay, Neil's going to be here any minute. Let's just take a break. So he gives me a drink and uh, I think it was like, you know, orange juice or something, um, you know, no alcohol, we're, we're working. And uh, next thing you know, the, I hear a knock on the door and, and Terry says, okay, I'm going to go let him in. And then up, because we were... I think we were downstairs in Terry's house, as I recall. So the next thing you know, Terry comes walking downstairs. Who's walking in behind them? Neil Peart. And I'm like, oh, my God. Inside, I'm like, holy shit, it's Neil. Terry immediately. I stand up. Terry says, Neil, this is Tim. We're working on a session. He plays in a Beatles tribute band. And uh, we're working on some overdubs. And Neil shakes my hand. Nice to meet you, Tim. And, oh, what songs are you doing? You know, I, I'm a huge Beatle fan. And I'm actually getting shivers telling you this story right now, guys. I'm actually getting shivers. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm reliving the excitement of that moment. So I immediately, you know, I'm trying to be calm. Just imagine what's going on inside of me. Oh, my God, this, you know here's Neil right in front of me. This is Neil. And it's not a fan situation. We're, we're in a studio. Anyways, Neil starts talking to me and asking me a few questions and what songs are you doing? And then um, Terry kind of interrupted and just said, oh, we're doing um, Lady Madonna. Uh, we're doing a tambourine part for help. Um, we're doing some clapping and um, she loves you, I think it was, or something. I can't remember exactly what, what Terry said, but Neil says, oh, I'd love to hear it. And I'm like, oh, my God. Terry says, okay. Well, he says the overdubs are not added to the mix yet. The mix is complete, but we haven't added the overdubs. But I can let you hear the song um, without the overdubs at this point. So then Neil sits down. We all sit down. And Terry plays... Uh, Lady Madonna. No, he no, he played She Loves You, and that was complete. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. She loves you, yeah, 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 yeah. You think you lost your love? Well, I saw her yesterday. It's you she's thinking of, and she told me. That She Loves You was complete, except for, like I said, the overdubs. So anyways, Neil listens to it, and then he listens to one other, I think I think that, this great, and he, he looks at me and he says, yeah, you've really captured Ringo, and then he proceeds to tell me about how he's a huge Beatle fan, and Ringo was the reason he started, or he at least not necessarily started, but he was influenced by Ringo, and I'm like, yeah, man, me too, you know, and... It was just a moment of two drummers. At that moment, I actually calmed down a little bit because we're just now chatting and I'm realizing, you know, I already knew this, but Neil's just a, he's a normal person <clears throat> and he does not like fanboy. He does not like, you're a God. You're the reason I started drumming. You, you know, he doesn't like all the praise. And, and of course, Terry had warned me to stay away from that. So we're sitting there anyways, as, um, we're sitting there. I guess Terry says, well, let me just throw this um, brush part on the track and let's hear it. And Neil says, yeah, man, that's great. Really, really enjoyed it. And he said the sound was there. The vibe was there. He enjoyed the brush part. And um, so just imagine me sitting there and Neil is listening to me playing. Not me listening to Neil, which is the way it should be but it's Neil listening to me. And it blew my mind. And he was very nice to me. Anyways, they go and do their business because he's not there to listen to me play drums. 
this was just in the first few minutes of him showing up that Terry just said, here's what we're doing. And, um, you know, here's what Tim's doing and whatever. So then uh, they go and do their business. And I, I kind of leave the area because, you know, they wanted some privacy. So they're talking and whatever. About 20 minutes go by. And then Terry says, you know, you can come back in. So you come back in. And then um, Neil and I start talking about uh, the studio process, you know, like what microphones and, um, we start talking about pro tools and we start talking about how, you know, the recording back in the seventies. And I, I asked Neil a few questions about the way things were recorded back in the seventies, like when he recorded 2112 or caress of steel versus when he recorded something in, you know, um, 2000 and something. I can't remember the last albums that they recorded, but so we we're talking about microphones and recordings and studios and engineers and, you know, Terry and him were reminiscing and laughing about things. And it was just the three of us chatting and, and it was so awesome. And at that point, I, re I was very relaxed. The, the fanboy element had calmed down completely. And I was just producer and two drummers hanging out, having a good time. And then finally, Terry says to Neil, well, Neil, <clears throat> it's been great having you and all, but we got to get back to work. And Neil says, uh, you know, nice to meet you. He shakes my hand. And I said to him, I avoided the Neil. I'd love to have some lessons with you because that was what I really wanted to say to him. I asked him that in 1992 and he said, no, he doesn't teach. So that rang in my head and I fought off the let's have some lessons, Neil. I would love to have some lessons with you because I know we would say no. And it would also turn me into, it would change the vibe. So Neil says to me, you know, Tim, uh, I'd like to talk to you again sometime. It was nice to meet you. And now back in 2008, you know, obviously there was, there was cameras and uh, phones rather and whatnot, but I did not take a picture because Neil doesn't like pictures. I didn't ask for a picture. I didn't ask for an autograph, nothing. Even though I was fighting that, I wanted to get a picture. I didn't have a phone with me at the time, but Terry could have taken a picture of us, but I didn't ask him. So no phone picture, no autograph, no nothing. We just shook hands. He said he'd love to talk to me again. And then he actually said to Terry, I'd like to hear the final mixes. Now he left. We continued doing what we had to do and, and finish. Now I understand Terry sent the final mixes to Neil. Neil then messaged Terry and said, I'd like to contact Tim. And I got a message indirectly, not actually, it wasn't from Neil, but it was from his management team saying that um, he really enjoyed the final mixes and he thought it was that we, we sounded good and we really captured the essence of the Beatles. And he was impressed with the whole process. And he and reiterated again how much he enjoyed meeting me. And I was blown away by the whole thing. What a gentleman. And of course, this is Neil. You know, so, I mean, this was truly, truly an amazing experience for me and one that I'll never forget. Unfortunately, we lost Neil, I think in 2020, in January of 2020. I was devastated because, you know, he was only 68 or 69 years old at the time. He wasn't very old. He should never have passed away. We should still be listening to Rush and and, and listening to Neil's gifted drumming to this day. You know, I was, uh, it, it bugs me when, you know, guys like Dom Famulero who die at 68, Neil Peart dies right around the same age. And it's just sad with such great, brilliant people have to pass away sadly to cancer. Neil died of brain cancer. Dom died of um, uh, pancreatic cancer. So, I mean, you know, <clears throat> I like to donate and help out in the cancer world. This isn't a promo for fighting cancer, nothing to do with that. But, you you know, if you guys feel that um, you'd like to donate to a cause, I think cancer is a very worthy one. So, all right. On a happy note, I want to thank all of you who have subscribed to me lately. I want to thank you for the support, comments, whatnot. 
I got a great bunch of people here watching my channel now, and I really appreciate you all. Thanks very much for watching, and as always, keep drumming. See ya.